Hi, I'm Kat Kalashian, and this is the Live and Invest Overseas podcast. Today, we're here to talk about travel this summer, because it has been way too long since we were all allowed to get out and have some fun traveling. There has been a nearly two-year hiatus on international travel, and we are ready to get out there and start exploring the world again. So what follows is our Live and Invest Overseas 2022 summer bucket list for travel, all the places that our editors are dying to go to this summer. And we put out a call far and wide. So the people suggesting these locations are from all over the world. Europe, Asia, Africa, South America, the North America. Um, so <clears throat> here it is. Each one of these destinations, by the way, is also eager to welcome visitors back, but we are going to let you know what their current COVID restrictions are. <laughs> So let's get started with number one, the Turks and Caicos. You've probably heard this name many times throughout your life. It's a world famous, world class uh, beach destination with just powder sand beaches, cerulean waters, a vibrant coral reef, really one of the most famous beach destinations uh, for decades. Spectacular diving that attracts people from all over the world for mostly for diving, but also for snorkeling and other water sports. This sandy string of keys is located just southeast of Florida, and it's just a quick flight from Miami. And these postcard worthy beaches are worth the trip alone. They alone justify the entire point of coming here. The white sands lapped by the electric blue waters with nothing to interrupt your view in between. It's just uh, without comparison, really. The, if you'd like to go fishing, fishing is a huge pastime here, attracting deep sea and uh, shore fishermen from all over the world. You might catch some blue marlin, some sailfish, tuna, or wahoo. Paddleboarding, wind, kite, and parasailing are all very popular here as well. There are 40 islands here in these uh, caves, but only eight of them are actually inhabited. Island hopping on a small boat or a big yacht is a really fun way to discover some of these less known islands and uh, a really fun way to kind of get away from the crowds and the beaten path of the Turks and Caicos. You can also sail between Turks and Caicos to some of the neighboring islands, for example, the Bahamas or Cuba. You will need a permit to do this though, so it takes some planning ahead. Pamper yourself in the acclaimed spas and wellness centers that this I, uh, that these islands have going for them and indulging glitzy nights out at luxury nightclubs and casinos and hotels, five-star restaurants. This is really a bona fide luxury destination. In fact, it was actually named Luxury Destination of the Year in 2021 by the Caribbean Travel Awards. So you know that it lives up to its name. It's COVID-19 entry requirements at the moment. You must be fully vaccinated with at least two doses. The booster doses, doses are not as yet required. You can prove your vaccination status with a digital or a paper record. Masks are no longer required. Restaurants and bars are open without any capacity limits and inter-island travel is allowed. So very few restrictions here, you just, you do need to be vaccinated. Number two, the Azores and Madeira Islands of Portugal. Everyone who goes to Portugal, I mean, we talk about Portugal all the time. And we've been telling you about the Algarve and Lisbon and even the more Northern cities like Porto for a long time now. So those are where most people go. But just offshore from the mainland, there are these two archipelagos. They're very unique in the world. The Azores is farther offshore, kind of in the middle of the Atlantic, and the Madeiras are a little bit closer to Morocco. These both offer pristine landscapes, unspoiled nature, and adventurous travel experiences. The Azores, first of all, its natural beauty is just jaw-dropping. It's composed of nine islands, and it's often called the Hawaii of the Mid-Atlantic. As Hawaii was, it was formed by volcanic activity centuries ago, which leads to its dramatic scenery all over. The scenery just dominates here. Sharp peaks and valleys, sheathed in green. These are really postcard mountains anywhere you look. Fine sand beaches, lagoons, geysers, waterfalls, and thermal baths all are plentiful here. So it's not just about the beaches and the mountains. There's a lot of really unique geological attraction for these islands. It also won the award for Europe's leading adventure tourism destination in 2001 and 2020. Uh, it gives you an idea. Compared to the Turks and Caicos, we're no longer talking luxury. We're talking adventure and nature. Hiking tours are very popular, as is cycling and 
mountain biking. And canyoning is another fun sport that you can practice here. Mount Pico is the highest point in Portugal at 7,700 feet. And uh, it is located on the Azores. You can hike to the top of it for outstanding views in every direction. The fishing, diving, yachting here is second to none, as is the whale and dolphin watching. Of course, it is pretty far out of the way, so one of the lesser accessible islands or locations, sorry, on our list. Madeira is known as Garden Island. It's an abundance of just vegetation and flowering plants from one coast to the other. It was also formed by volcanic activity, so it has many points of elevation and spectacular scenery. Porto Santo and Seychelles beaches are rated some of the best in Europe this year by European beach destination. And natural and human-made pool complexes connected to the sea provide really interesting, unique, peaceful swimming opportunities all over the coast. Madeira wine is also hugely famous in its own right, and you can uh, organize tastings on the island, including at Blandy's Wine Lodge, and you can learn all about the Madeira winemaking process. The dollar strength versus the euro right now is another thing to keep in mind. Uh, it makes this summer one of the best times in 20 years, frankly, to be cashing in your U.S. dollars for euros. Uh, so great time to be traveling in the Eurozone this summer. So there are two places that you can go to do that. The COVID-19 entry requirements for the Azores and Madeira, you are not required to be vaccinated to come here. You can provide either a proof of vaccination or a negative test, which can be either a 72-hour PCR test or a 48-hour rapid antigen test or a certificate of recovery. So this is pretty unique. A lot of countries won't allow some of these other options like a certificate of recovery. If you are arriving from the Portuguese mainland, uh, the above or just a 24 hour rapid antigen test will suffice to get you to the islands. Number three on our list is Cotor Montenegro. I wouldn't blame you if you couldn't point out Montenegro on a map. I'm sure a few people can. It's a tiny Adriatic country and it's only made up of about half a million people. That's 2,050 square miles, which is slightly less than the state of Connecticut. Uh, so very small uh, country, very small population. It's in southern Europe. It's nestled between Croatia and Albania. So we're on the Adriatic Sea over here. And the views really are otherworldly. Although it is nestled in kind of a corner of Europe, it's very unique architecturally. And uh, in fact, it, KOTOR, the capital, it delivers old world European charm in spades. You can't find it better really anywhere else. The old town is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's considered the best preserved medieval town in the Mediterranean. The ancient stone walls marking the city limits on two of their three sides are a major tourist draw. And that designation, you know, the fact that it's the best preserved medieval town on the Mediterranean, that goes a long way. There are no shortage of medieval towns all along the Mediterranean. So the fact that Kotor is said to be the best preserved is quite, quite a statement for the EU to say. The medieval architecture here is really just so much fun to get lost in. The narrow lanes, winding alleyways, the big squares, the picturesque markets and, you know, historic sites all over. St. Trifon's Cathedral, for example, uh, was built in the 11th century and is one of the country's two Roman Catholic cathedrals. Um, but it's also the natural beauty of this coast that is a reason to, to visit. So the craggy inlets of the Bay of Couture, um, it's one of the most indented parts of the Adriatic Sea. Um, and the bay actually features two islands, Gospa Od, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this. I'm going to put it up on the screen and <laughs> tell me if you can pronounce that. Um, but it translates to Our Lady of the Rock. The other island, which I'm also not going to try and pronounce, uh, but translates to the island of St. George, they're both steeped in local folklore. So a really fun place to visit, not just for the city, but also for the bay and all of the natural, uh, natural attractions of its sea and nature. Croatia receives hordes of tourists every year, but Montenegro basically delivers the exact same thing as Croatia right next door and with fewer crowds at a lower price often. Uh, so great reasons to visit Montenegro this year. And if that wasn't enough, they've dropped all entry requirements related to COVID and no, imposes no vaccination, testing, health screening, curfew, or any other restrictions. So really, it's as if COVID never happened here and uh, you'll have nothing standing in your way of a good time. Number four is Serra, Brazil, uh, long famous for its miles of golden sand beaches. This is nothing new. Brazil's beaches are, are not new territory that we're, we're 
<laughs> rolling out here. But if you want to go someplace other than Ipanema and Copacabana, and you want to find a little bit more of an authentic experience, the northeastern state of Serra um, is where there are stunning beaches without the crazy crowds and the prices of Rio, for example. Brazil, as I say, not a new beach destination. It's got over 5,000 miles of coastline. But the 370-mile stretch of this region that we're talking about right now is often called the best in the country. Gorgeous stretches of virgin sand, swaying palm trees, and otherworldly dunes, you know, all of the, the travel, travel word bingo. Um, but uh, it is one of Brazil's top domestic tourism locations, which, uh, it, for example, means that the prices are much lower. It's much more affordable, but they've still got first rate amenities. So the fact that this isn't a drawing quite as many international tourists means that it is more authentic and it's a more Brazilian experience than going to uh, a more popular international resort community on Brazil's coast. And it's you can really find isolated outposts here. So as I said, many of these beaches are city beaches with first rate amenities, but you can also go and find these little stretches where you're not gonna see another person for miles. Peaceful bays with gentle waters, exposed strips for ripping around in a, a kite or windsurfing apparatus. Um, and the heart of the cultural activity of Serra is the city of Fortaleza, which is one of Brazil's biggest. It's home to three million people, and it's a quintessentially Brazilian beach town. Fishermen offer their daily catch from wooden tables set up along the beach. Uh, you know, the boardwalk has been there for decades. These, these guys are generational fishermen. Uh, the men shimmy up trees to, to hack down the coconut for you. And all over the beaches, you'll see the ever active Brazilians playing volleyball, soccer, yoga, whatever it is. Uh, Brazilians don't like to sit still for long. The domestic tourism, as I say, means that prices here are really low. They're much more affordable than in many of the more well-known Brazilian resorts. And the US dollar, once again, as with the euro, is incredibly strong right now against the Brazilian real, making this a great time to take advantage. Everything from eating out to staying in a hotel or buying a beach home comes at a significant discount right now, but that won't last. Right now, you must be fully vaccinated to enter Brazil, uh, and you'll need, uh, if you have a health condition that prevents you from getting vaccinated, you'll need to prove it by showing a negative 24-hour PCR or antigen test before boarding your flight. And there is no quarantine as long as you provide that. Number five is Malta, which is a string of three islands in the Mediterranean. They are English speaking. This is a very important point. This is probably the only, well, it is the only place in the Mediterranean that you can speak English as an official language. But it's one of the few places in Europe as well. Obviously, the UK and Ireland speak English but they're not exactly rolling out the welcome mat to uh, invite visitors, especially North Americans, to come and live. They don't want more residents. They don't want more citizens. Malta, on the other hand, does. They've even incentivized residency and citizenship on the islands. So it is one of the tiniest countries in Europe, and it is an island, well, an archipelago, I guess. It's got one of the tiniest capitals in Europe, Valletta, which is half less than half a square mile. It's often called the Supervissima, which is Latin for most proud. And the historical treasures in this city I had my honeymoon there and really it, it doesn't disappoint. Every corner is, uh, you know, this winding cobblestone street just chock full of monuments, uh, historical sites, churches, things to see and do. It's a very modern European capital with great shopping by day and great entertainment by night. In fact, it's a destination for nighttime entertainment. Although you can avoid it if you want to. In 2018, Valletta was named the European Capital of Culture, which may, meant that it uh, benefited from lots of little facelifts, renovations, cleaning programs, etc. So many of its beautiful old buildings look better now than they have in decades, if not centuries. Comino and Gozo are the two other islands. Malta is the main island where you would likely be living. But if you're looking for a more off the beaten path experience or lifestyle, Gozo is a great option. Uh, we actually have a report on Gozo. One of our editors spent time there and fell in love with it. And it is even cheaper than it is to live in Malta, um, but it is a very agricultural society. There's not a lot to do there. Comino even more so. Comino is 100% agricultural and there's really not that much to do there otherwise. So you can go and visit, but Comino isn't necessarily a place I'd recommend for living. Secluded bays, dramatic cliffs, tiny coves, ancient forts, and quaint little fishing harbors. All of these things are, uh, you know, had by the dozen in Malta. It's got some really great legends to go with it, too. This is uh, where St. Paul was said to have been shipwrecked. 
It's also where there it was the site of some legendary naval battles in World War II. So boatloads, if you'll excuse the pun, boatloads of nautical history to be had here. Great, uh, great sailing destination, great fishing, fishing destination. But the Ottoman galleys and the British destroyers of old have been replaced now by these, you know, peaceful little white triangle sail scooting by. And if you want to be one, uh, there really is no better place to sail in the Mediterranean. Uh, other water sports, of course, you're only limited by your imagination what you can do on the water here. There's also a really significantly low rate of crime and very friendly locals. Um, and this is, you know, one of the best Mediterranean destinations in Europe, both for living and for tourism. What are the requirements right now? You do need either a vaccine certificate or a recovery certificate or a negative test result it must be a 72 hour PCR or a 24 hour rapid antigen. Or if you can't provide any of that, you can also quarantine for 10 days. If you test negatively after seven days, you will be released from quarantine. Number six is Salta, Argentina. Uh, and like Portugal, most people head for Patagonia or Buenos Aires or Bariloche. Most people aren't so familiar with Salta, which is a province in northwestern Argentina, bordering Bolivia, Paraguay, and Chile. And uh, it stands out for its incredible desert landscapes. It's uh, a really rich Andean and Quechua culture here, so very traditional, uh, very much connected to nature. It's a very rugged region. This is not a luxury destination by any means. Its capital city is known as Salta de Linda, Salta the Pretty, uh, and it's a cultural hub with a unique historic flair, definitely worth a visit. Start in the city of Salta, the most Spanish-looking city in Argentina, I promise you. And uh, it's well-preserved historic center of colonial buildings, square churches, and parks will get you off to a great start in this uh, region of Argentina. You should also attend a Peña, which is a folk music concert here. Uh, it feature, It's a really, really uh, strong Spanish heritage style of music, so Spanish guitars, drums, violins, and dancing. Spectators are strongly encouraged to participate and stomp alone, and this really reflects the region's Spanish and indigenous heritage. There's a delicious regional cuisine that you shouldn't miss out on, as well as a laid-back laid nightlife scene. Theater, markets, exhibitions, festivals, museums about local history, art, and archaeology. The start of summer in the States corresponds with the start of winter in Argentina. So if you are going to spend some time there this summer, know that it will be a little bit cooler, but it won't be as cold as the more touristed parts of the southern part of the country. The Salta province has more temperate climate year-round, so it won't be quite as, as chilly, but it's definitely not a hot weather climate if you're going in the summer. From June to September, you can expect clear skies and temperatures of about 55 degrees daily. So perfect temperature to take advantage of all of the natural attractions and the outdoor activities there. No vaccination or testing requirements on tourists coming from the States are currently required. If you're not fully vaccinated, you should get tested within 24 hours of arriving, but it's an honor system. All you've got to do is fill out a form attesting that you're COVID free. You will, however, need medical insurance that covers any COVID related issues before coming here. So hospitalization, hospitalization for instance, um, or the cost of self-isolation or medical transportation. Number seven is Caño Cristales, Colombia. And uh, Colombia is one of only 17 countries in the world that qualifies as megadiverse. So Caño Cristales is um, a river that's famous for flowing uh, in vibrant and unexpected colors and definitely is one of the reasons that Colombia makes the mega diversity list. You may have heard of this river. It's Famous. It's called the liquid rainbow often. Um, it's because of algae on the riverbed that changes colors as it blooms or dies. Uh, so throughout its life cycle, it might go from yellow to green to blue to black and uh, red above all. So it's one of the most unique travel experiences in the world. And it can only be seen at specific times of year. So this is really the perfect time of year to go see it if you would like to see the red hue that's currently on right now. But time your visit carefully and make sure that you book through an experienced tour agency. This is not a place where you want to try and go it alone if you want to make the most of this trip and get uh, get the real experience out of it. Aside from the algae and the, the liquid rainbow, you'll see the jungle, obviously, rock formations, and countless wildlife species. There are over 400 species of bird in the park home, uh, in the park <laughs> right now. Bird watching and kayaking tours can be arranged. 
monkeys are going to be all over. You'll probably encounter a few monkeys. And if you're really lucky, one of the pink river dolphins, which are very rare and an endangered species. So now, right now, is the time for red algae. May through November is the official season, but July through October is the peak. So keep that in mind. And right now, you can fill out the check MIG, check MIG form between 24 hours and one hour before departure and present the confirmation email on arrival in order to come in uh, to Columbia since COVID. But if you're fully vaccinated, that's all you've got to do. If you're not fully vaccinated, you'll have to show a 74 hour negative PCR or antigen test as well as filling out that form. So uh, all of these places are, as I say, willing to welcome tourists once again. And we are all jumping on a plane and getting out there as fast as we can because we are all so glad that the COVID restrictions are being eased up. We don't have to wear masks at these historical sites anymore or in the churches. Uh, we don't have to have masks selfies anymore when we take a picture in front of the pink dolphins. So get out there and enjoy it. And if you've got any questions uh, about uh, other destinations that you're considering going to this summer, questions about traveling with COVID, comments on any of the destinations we've talked about here today, I encourage you to get involved and please subscribe to get any one of these videos in your uh, YouTube library every Saturday. Uh, I have been Kat Kalashian and happy trails. Mm -hmm.